see that uh, this is a sort of a workshop that we sort of put together over the, in the last what, three months or so, so in, a, in, a, in a sort of a rapid response format. And it's a rather unique workshop for us, not just in topics also, but the uh, way we have done it. You notice that there are no official organizers. This ITAM is sort of part in discussion with the advisory board on how to do these things. But some of us have installed ourselves as chairs in the different sessions at ITAM. So all the chairs are, 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 are local uh, folks. You know, it, it, I think this is a fantastic topic, especially to have in a place like here at the Center for Astrophysics. There are some local cosmologists who will also be giving talks. And most not today, this afternoon, and also tomorrow. And, you know, but atomic physics is, as you also know, is playing a very large role. But it's the low energy precision measurements to test physics beyond, beyond the standard model. Two interferometry and, and, and uh, time standards, you know, sensing the clocks. You know, it's, it's sort of tabletop atomic physics. It will do more even. In this area. So we look forward to the discussions today and tomorrow. In the afternoon, of course, we'll go over to physics, which is about 15 minutes more of this walk today to the next day for colloquium given by Mark. So Mark will start the day and will end the day as well. So <laughs> he didn't know this a few, few weeks ago. Um, there are a few things I'd like to announce. Is that uh, Victor Flambaum on Friday evening wrote that due to, to some emergency, I hope everything is okay with him, he's in Santa Barbara, had to cancel his, his visit. He was going to actually come and spend time here at ITAM for a week. So, but he has sent his PowerPoint, which will go on the web if anybody wishes to, to look at them. But instead, I've asked uh, Andrew Garachi to who speaks today or is supposed to be spoken today around noon to shift his talk to tomorrow in, in, in uh, Baker's time slot. Okay? And, and I think it sort of fits because it also he's going to talk about ways to sort of measure these axions in, in dark matter. And tomorrow's session is on dark matter. A few other things is that if you need help, you can just find us. Jim is over there. I go over there and you know me. And uh, if anything, and for lunch, uh, you could go to Harvard Square, but of course you have to find your way back, which takes time. But the best options are about half a block from here, and also in, I think in the back of this book, booklet, it tells you a few things about where to find the very good food. Okay, half a block from here on Huron and Concord, there are a few, few meters, and a little bit further down in Huron Village as well, but in the five or so in the block. So, I think uh, with that, I think I should uh, not take too much more of your time, and we will have Mark with the, the first talk. Thanks. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to tell you about some work, uh, experimental work at Stanford, where we're uh, trying to push the precision frontier with atom to Broly wave interferometry. And, uh, because these guys have tortured me with two talks today, I want to assure you that I've orthogonalized the talks, so <laughs> I hope there won't be too much repetition between uh, this morning's talk and this afternoon's talk. Uh, today, I, this morning, I really wanted to drill into uh, you know, some, of the, some of the applications that we might envision with uh, this sort of apparatus we've been developing over the past decade. Uh, at Stanford, and I would, uh, small audience, I of course, you know, welcome uh, discourse during the presentation if you, if you have questions, comments, or uh, ideas. So, uh, let me introduce you to our apparatus. I should say that uh, Susanna Dickerson, who's in the audience, Susanna, raise your hand. She was instrumental in building this. <laughs> uh, this is this is a, a large-scale atom interferometer, a ten-meter tower, where. Uh, we uh, notionally have set this up to make a measurement of the uh, equivalence principle by comparing the free fall rates of two different atomic isotopes, rubidium-85 and 87, uh, using atom interferometric techniques. And uh, while we're not there yet, we, uh, when we 
designed the experiment, we saw a path to statistical sensitivities on the order of 10 to the minus 15 of little g uh, for the differential uh, acceleration of 85 and 87. And systematics, uh, we, you know, we did some error analysis. I'll tell you a little bit about that where we thought we could be at the part in uh, 10 to the 16. And so sort of the first part of this uh, talk is a progress report on this experiment, and then uh, the, the lighter part of the talk is, uh, you know, where, where we think we can go in the future. Uh, so testing the uh, weak equivalence principle, uh, Peter Ossenbaum put together this nice chart. I like his graphic here. Uh, so this is year uh, from 1600 up to 2000, and this is uh, the precision of uh, uh, WEP tests, uh, and they've been, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's a logarithmic progression, but uh, there are some notable uh, uh, data points here. Uh, torsion balances and lunar laser ranging uh, have achieved really uh, remarkable precision uh, in the recent decade. And uh, just to, you know, kind of give you some pictures to associate with those, uh, one is, uh, here, here's lunar laser ranging, uh, which achieves uh, precision at, you know, over 10 to the minus 13 of G, and uh, here's a torsion pendula uh, at WASH group uh, that also is in uh, the 10 to the minus 13 uh, regime. And you, you may know that there's a space-based uh, experiment that's, uh, you know, in, in, I think almost uh, collecting data microscope that hopes to achieve 10 to the minus 14. And lots of people have had ideas that take you from 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 18. And there's lots of supporting theory out there that says, you know, what level is interesting and what level is not interesting. I think uh, a lot of people want to get to the 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 18 level. And that, that looks like it's difficult, uh, even with the atom interferometry uh, in the near term. But, you know, who knows? Uh, you might ask, well, you know, why do you care about the weak equivalence principle? And uh, the standard answer is the foundation or GR and so on. And there's been a recent, uh, which I, th I think that's a legitimate reason to go there. Uh, but there's been recent uh, theory uh, where, and uh, you know, people have been putting WP in the context of searches for dark matter. And uh, I just, I, I learned of another paper that I missed on this by one of the, two of the attendees today. So I, I didn't have a chance to update my chart, but, uh, you know, if you're making if you're making a WEP test, then uh, depending on you know your kind of uh, envisioned interaction uh, with with new physics, you can uh, constrain uh, your theory. And so, I, don't ask me to explain this graph much more than to say that on in this paper, on the archive, uh, uh, Peter Graham, one of my colleagues and, co and co-workers at, at, at Stanford and Berkeley, have taken a look at uh, how, how you can constrain various models. Uh, if you have precision uh, differential accelerometers like you, of the nature that you build for a uh, uh, WEP experiment. And uh, so I, I think it's interesting to say that uh, in addition to testing uh, a cornerstone of relativity, you also, depending on uh, constraints uh, uh, or, or theory, uh, you, you, you test uh, certain, certain versions of uh, dark matter hypotheses. Uh, so now I want to tell you a bit about our experiment. Uh, what, what we have uh, is a dual isotope interferometer, and very schematically, uh, we start at the bottom of that 10-meter fountain with uh, two clouds of ultra-cold, uh, nearly Bose-condensed uh, uh, rubidium isotopes, 85 and 87. Their uh, kinematic temperatures are in the nanokelvin or below a nanokelvin, which means that when you launch these clouds of atoms, they barely expand over that 10-meter flight. They come back down. If they start off like being 100 microns in size, that cloud is going to end up being a few hundred microns in width. That's crucial because you don't want it to blow out of the, the laser beams that you use to uh, manipulate the atomic wave packets. And then over their flight through that fountain, uh, you hit them with a bunch of pulses of light uh, using the standard so-called light pulse interferometry technique, which uh, serves to coherently divide, uh, redirect, and recombine uh, the wave packets. And in recent work, uh, where uh, kind of our parameters for this experiment, I should say, uh, we work with about a two-second flight time over the full interferometer, uh, limited by the uh, height of the vacuum tube. And uh, the atom optics we use amount to uh, transferring about 20 photon recoils worth of momentum. Each photon recoils 5 millimeters per second. So over a one-second flight time, these atom wave packets can separate by uh, substantial distances, uh, you know, tens of centimeters in, 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 the, in the EP work. And uh, in, in terms of maybe a technical detail, uh, we'd like to drive that number, the, the momentum recoil, as high as possible. That's proportional to the sensitivity in the measurement. 
Uh, for these differential isotope measurements, you're limited by, uh, we use Bragg atom optics, the, the, the atom optics being able to simultaneously address both atomic species because of their uh, differing masses. So uh, that's, that's the overall uh, schematic. And let's just run through some numbers, uh, what kind of precision you might hope to achieve with, with those uh, notional parameters, which uh, you know, I'll show you we realized more or less in the lab. So uh, this is the overall you know, standard light shift formula for you know, very leading order phase shift uh, for the, uh, the, the differential phase between two arms of the uh, interfering paths for either 85 or 87. Uh, parameterized in terms of the momentum transfer of the beam splitter, the nominal acceleration due to gravity, which is going to, you know, in our, in our world now, is going to differ between rubidium 85 and 87, and the, the interrogation time t between the pulses. And uh, remarkably, if you, with, with this, this kind of 10-meter apparatus and uh, these parameters, uh, with one second interrogation time, you, you, you see two billion radians of phase evolve uh, between the interfering arms. Uh, before the wave pack has come together for 1G of acceleration. So then you say, well, okay, if I have 10 to the 5 atoms per shot, which is kind of, that's where we're working right now, and you achieve shot noise uh, resolution on the readout, which is, we're, we're close to that, then you can resolve phase shifts on the order of 3 milliradians per shot. Each shot is, uh, takes us about 20 seconds. Uh, that means your, ex your uh, sensitivity uh, is on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 12, that should be uh, delta G over G, 10 to the minus 12 uh, per shot. And so uh, if you have 10 to the 4 shots or about a week of data collection, that puts you in the low 14s uh, for your EP statistical sensitivity alone. Uh, and comparing that to the current state of the art uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 13 and the objectives for microscope, which people will be happy to get in the 14s, I think, uh, this seems to be of a legitimate science goal. Uh, so that's a statistical sensitivity. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, when you write the proposals, you say, oh, we're not going to integrate for a week, but the lifetime of graduate student, you know, five years or something like that. So you know, that, that's how you can say you might be able to get down to 10 to the minus 15 and so forth. So, but we all know that it ain't about the statistics. It's about the systematics. And so, uh, Let's, uh, you know, I want to tell you about uh, systematic sensitivity, uh, systematic uh, effects. But first, uh, let me just give you a, a, a little more insight into the apparatus and, uh, and give you a little bit of a tour of some of the data. So uh, this is our machine in more detail. Uh, everything looks better in CAD, so this is a CAD of that. Uh, at the bottom of this, uh, it's located in this pit in the Varian Physics Building, uh, basement of, uh, of, of our, our building. And down here on the floor of that pit, it's pretty inertially quiet, about shaking up and down about 10 to the minus 8, a little g, which helps you uh, because it, it's, it's nice to have a fairly stable environment to start. But keep in mind the differential accelerations we're sensing are 10 to the minus 14, uh, we hope to. So uh, you, know, you, you, you need to do something to uh, uh, get rid of those, uh, this, this common mode uh, uh, co-acceleration measurement between 85 and 87 is crucial to uh, get, get rid of that, that spurious vibration. At any rate, there's, there's a mirror that's bolted to the floor. That mirror retroreflects the atom optics beam, which propagate along the vertical axis to drive the, the transitions. Here's our atomic source. Uh, we first uh, uh, laser cool rubidium 87, then we evaporatively cool it. Uh, and then we uh, bring in some 85 and sympathetically cool the 85. They both come down to close to BEC transition, if not below it. Then we uh, do a delta kick expansion phase to relax the chemical potential. And we wind up with temperatures as low as 100 picokelvin for the, the two ensembles. Then they get launched with uh, a moving optical lattice launch, where they're, they're put in a corrugated potential. And the potential drags the atoms vertically along these uh, ballistic trajectories. And then, bam, here comes the light pulses along this vertical axis that divide, redirect, and recombine the wave packets. They fall back down to the detection region. And uh, at that position, uh, we take pictures of the atom clouds, and we record the pictures uh, with CCD cameras. And by looking at the pictures, we measure the phase shifts. From the phase shifts, we get derive a differential phase shift and, uh, in principle, make a test of the equivalence principle. Let's see. Crucial uh, experimental details, it's important to Take care of magnetic field gradients. Those, that's a systematic effect. So uh, uh, three-layer magnetic shield here, taking the magnetic field, uh, grade, magnetic field below uh, a milligauss and the gradients to levels where they, they should be contributing at the 10 to the minus 16 level. 
We have to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. If we don't uh, steer the axis of the laser beams that manipulate the atomic weight packets, uh, the fact that the uh, Earth is rotating changes the inertial axis of measurement axis and leads you to a situation where you don't see interference. So we have a precision tilt, tip, tilt stage down here that compensates the angle of that beam at the, the nanoradian level. Uh, what does the data look like? So uh, we take the data in what we call a phase shearing mode, and uh, that amounts to tipping the angle purposely of the final atom optic beam by just a little bit at the output beam splitter. This is like misaligning your Mach Zender interferometer so you see fringes if you're doing an interferometer for light so that you see interference fringes across your detector. Uh, we do that uh, with our final atom optic beam splitter and that puts interference fringes across uh, the atomic clouds. And so just to orient you to this, uh, this is real data here. Uh, these are the uh, outputs of the interferometer. We've adjusted the timing so that 85 and 87 show up at slightly different locations in the detection plane. We're detecting by flashing on a resonant pulse of light and collecting uh, with high numerical aperture the scattered radiation. Uh, this is one output port of the rubidium 85 interferometer. This is the other output port. Uh, obviously, those two output ports, the, if one fringe is in phase, the other should be out of phase, so where I have dark, I should see brightness, and the, the kind of the contrast is given by the, 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 the depth of those valleys to the height of the uh, signal there. And then simultaneously, we have rubidium-87. In this shot, there weren't quite as many rubidium-87 atoms, uh, where you see the uh, 87 uh, fringes for one cloud and the 87 fringes for the other output port of the interferometer. And the brightness here uh, is the number of atoms, and the phase is given by the position of those fringes. On any given shot, those, the phase is, is random because there's a, a random vibration of the bottom a mirror, which reads into the overall phase shift. But the idea is, more or less, uh, those phases should be locked together. And so I can, I can illustrate that by showing you this, this progression. This is a sequence of uh, uh, shots uh, where you, if, on, on any given shot, you, you see that these, these fringes are uh, w well aligned, but they, they dance uh, shot to shot. So the measurement strategy is to uh, data extract the, the phase and the phase, calculate the differential phase, and uh, you know, that, that in principle is your uh, equivalence principle measurement. Uh, okay, so let's talk about possible errors. Uh, straightforward using uh, known techniques for calculating the phase shifts to derive an error model for this sensor. Uh, and uh, you can put in the kitchen sink, in which is what I've done for this chart. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to go and read you through all the possible contributions. But shoot, there's lots of things that can go wrong. Uh, you could have a, a residual rotation. That tip, tilt compensation may not be perfect. There may be angle jitter in that. The residual at gravity gradients. Uh, the proof masses may not overlap. Uh, the, the atom optics pulses may not be perfect. Every one of these things, in principle, can lead you to a differential phase shift, which could uh, masquerade as an equivalence principle violation. And so, uh, like any precision measurement, the, the, the work is rolling up your sleeves and under, making sure you understand uh, these effects. And uh, while we have you know, the data I just showed you, this, the statistics on that data are fantastic and, and kind of almost better than we hoped for, for for kind of being in the first year of this. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do uh, on the systematics before we, I have any confidence about telling you uh, what our uh, numbers uh, might look like. So let me uh, distill that table just a little bit and, and focus in on uh, the systematic that we're focused on right now. Uh, so kind of taking a few of those terms and highlighting them. This here is the dominant term, which is our, our science term. And uh, these are other uh, terms that, uh, when you look at the phase shifts, uh, enter. Uh, here, omega is the rotation of the platform. V is the velocity of the atom. TZZ here is the gravitational gradient, the change in the acceleration due to gravity as a function of uh, position. And uh, it turns out this was, uh, you know, is, is sort of uh, troublesome. And so let's, let's take a, a, a look at some of these gravity gradient terms. There are two of them that uh, I can talk about. The so-called quantum recoil term here, this is a recoil shift associated with the momentum recoil of the transition. I have more to say about that. That's the Earth's gravity gradient or the gravity gradient of the Earth plus the apparatus. And uh, that's, uh, th this number here is on the order of 10 to the minus 6 inverse second squared. 
Uh, and x here is the position of the clouds. If the position of the two clouds, 85 or 87, is slightly different, then they start off at a different position in the gravitational field. It looks like a differential acceleration, and that is, you know, your equivalence principle violation if you're not careful. Uh, so I want to talk about this term and this term right now. Uh, let's take a look at the quantum curvature term first. Uh, that's conceptually an interesting uh, phase shift that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in, in, a, in a few seconds. But uh, just from the point of view of systematic, note that it has uh, a dependence on the mass of uh, the atom. And so uh, 85 and 87 have different scale factors, uh, and they experience this gradient uh, differently. And so, uh, you know, that if, if there's a finite gradient there, then this is a, a phase shift offset which needs to be characterized. And, and thinking naively about this, what that says is you have to make darn sure you know what the gravity gradient in your apparatus uh, is. And just to give you uh, an idea of the size of this effect, for Earth gradient, uh, this is on the order of 10 to the minus 10. So if you want to get to 10 to the minus 15, it means you need to know the characterize the Earth's gravitational gradient at the 10 to the minus 5 level, which from the point of view of statistics and instruments performance looks like it could be feasible. Uh, the second one uh, is the, I'll call it the proof mass misalignment uh, error. If these two isotopes start off at different uh, altitudes, if you will, then this leads to uh, a, a differential phase shift just because they start with different accelerations due to gravity. And for a 0.1 millimeter misalignment in the centroids of the cloud, that talks, that talks to, that's about 10 to, a few parts in 10 to 11. Again, if you measure that offset, uh, which you, I think we can do pretty accurately, and you know TZZ, then you're, you're going to be uh, pretty good to go, but it requires care. There's some, some great ideas uh, from uh, Europe also on how to uh, deal with this shift that I don't have time to talk about. Uh, this was considered the most troubling shift. I, I don't think it's going to, in the, looking forward, is, is going to be as much of a problem as people have thought. But both of these kind of point you in the direction of, hey, let's make sure we understand gravitational gradients. So uh, we went about, we've been all about gravitational gradients in the last six months. And I want to show you a, a pretty cool gravity gradiometer uh, that's uh, just starting to really work well in the lab. So what I want to do is trace out the space-time diagram of a uh, interferometer topology which is really good at measuring gravitational gradients. And so here we go. What I, in the picture I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, chart you, the center of mass motion of an atomic weight packet uh, for, for just rubidium-87 atoms as a function of time, and then uh, convince you that the, the topology I'm tracing out is going to be something that's great about telling you about gravity gradients. So here's our humble cloud of rubidium-87 atoms. And in this picture, I'm neglecting gravitational sag. I'm only, so forget about the fact that these atoms are flying up and flying down a parabola. Subtract off that parabola, and we're just looking about what happens of the residuals around that parabola uh, associated with the gravity gradient. So here come, here come the atoms. We hit them with one set of light pulses, which, uh, where we uh, basically serve to separate that cloud in two. And we use 100-photon uh, recoil uh, momentum separation, which is quite a bit, corresponds to about a half meter se se second recoil. These things shoot apart. Uh, we wait a certain amount of time, and then we come in with more light pulses. Uh, and after they've separated about 30 centimeters, we hit, we hit them with another set of light pulses, which uh, basically unwinds that 100-photon uh, recoil gets them ready for uh, a first atom optic sequence, which uh, is a 30-photon recoil beam splitter, which acts simultaneously at the two locations, opening up two diamonds. And then we uh, wait for 600 to 900 milliseconds. Uh, the atoms are separated by 15 centimeters of weight packets. Uh, and then we, we close the interferometers We use uh, we, by waiting another uh, you know, 600 to 900 milliseconds. And, uh, applying the right amount of photon recoil momenta. We phase shear them, and this is not a space-time diagram here. This just shows you that it, how, we, how we are going to read out the fringes by tipping the angle of one of the, the, the exit beam splitter. And then we uh, have two clouds that are separated by 30 centimeters. Uh, we've got to bring them back together, so we have another momentum recoil, which is chosen to basically bring this set of wave packets close to this set of wave packets. And we look at those two guys simultaneously, and there's data. And uh, so here's one set of interference fringes associated with this interference interferometer, another set of interference fringes associated with this interferometer. And uh, notionally, uh, you know, there's corrections to this, but this top diamond is measuring G1, the acceleration due to gravity up here. This bottom diamond is measuring acceleration G2. 
difference in gravity being gravity gradient over uh, a, a finite displacement. Uh, there are a lot of merits to this scheme if you're interested in developing gravity gradiometer instrumentation. Uh, one of the major sources of error is uh, scale factor and, and uh, imbalances between your two accelerometers. And this configuration is, is beautifully common mode for many of this. So I think this is of technological significance. But right now, we're just talking about its impact on uh, gravity gradient uh, EP. So how well can you do? Well, uh, just looking at data like this, which were nearly shot noise limited on the readout, uh, our resolution is uh, at, at 10 to minus 9 uh, inverse second squared per shot, which is uh, good enough to, in principle to compensate for uh, the, the, the terms I, I showed you uh, previously. And just to set the scale, uh, the Earth's gravity gradient is on the order of 3 10 to the minus 6 inverse second squared. So uh, on a single shot, we get, you know, in, mid 10 to the 4 is on Earth's gravity gradient uh, with, with, with these clouds of atoms. And of course, you can accumulate statistics uh, after that. Uh, so we set about measuring the gravity gradient of our apparatus. Because <laughs> so, this is a system, I mean, nothing really scientifically great and interesting about this other than that it's a nasty systematic for uh, that EP measurement. And so by changing the launch height, we can, uh, this is 10 meters, and the weight packet, the, the, the diamond separations were 30 centimeters, and the, the diamonds themselves were 15 centimeters. By scanning up and down vertically, we can measure the gravity gradient as a function of height. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, no, uh, that's must not. That's the one. Uh, Gravity gradient is a function of launch height, and so this is launch height. This is the gravity gradient in ETFOSH units. This is, uh, if you're building gravity gradiometer instrumentation, this is the accepted unit, 10 to the minus 9 in per second squared. And this is the gravity gradient as a function of height. So it's nothing like there's the uniform spherical Earth gravity gradient. Of course it isn't, because this thing's in a pit. You know, there's stuff nearby. There's a mass distribution, local mass distribution, is doing all sorts of nasty things to the local uh, gravitational field, which if you're thinking about testing equivalence principle and you're thinking like a theorist, is a problem. Because, uh, you know, equivalence principle is something that says, let's neglect curvature of the gravitational field and just as assume that space time is flat in that area. Now I'm showing you that, you know, space time ain't flat in the region where I care. And so my two isotopes are, in principle, exploring that curvature in different ways, which uh, is getting away from the whole idea of equivalence. So, uh, you know, understanding this and making sure we correct for it properly is, is central. Uh, so just to, just to have some fun with this, you say, well, boy, it seems like we're doing pretty well in measuring gravity gradients. Can we measure gravity gradients of other stuff? Let's uh, go and uh, put some bricks nearby the apparatus. And bricks used to be I had to take a, a stack of bricks like this big and drop them near the, uh, the apparatus and then wait like half a day and you get to see the signal. Now with this kind of sensitivity, single shots, you see a tiny number of bricks. I mean, this is like seven lead bricks that were just brought up next to the apparatus. and uh, you know, here's what the, the, the data points look like. The statistical resolution is better than the scatter here. We're not quite sure why the, the, the scatter is as large as it is. But this phase shift between bricks in and bricks out, these things are about 25 centimeters from this geometry, is on the order of, of radians, which is huge compared to previous work. Uh, so what are we doing? Well, we're measuring the curvature of the gravitational field from those bricks. That turns out to be... it. Uh, something that's been a, a, a long time goal of the matter wave uh, interferometry field. In fact, back in 84, uh, Anadin, uh, in the context of neutron interferometry, uh, just after uh, the, the CA, COW experiment, they said, oh, that's great, we're measuring acceleration due to gravity. Well, acceleration due to gravity in the, in the context of GR is a kinematic effect. It's observer dependent. Uh, you, you can think of you know, simple ways of understanding why you, you have that phase shift. And then then said, well, you know, if you really wanted to talk about gravity and quantum mechanics, not quantum gravity, but gravity and quantum mechanics, the first, uh, you know, real GR shift you ought to be looking for is the one that depends on the Riemann curvature and Planck's constant. So he says this back in 84 and proposes some experiments with neutrons that were really difficult to do. Uh, this was picked up again by uh, Odresch and um, Marcelin in, in 94, where they specialized for atom interferometry. And... Uh, 
proposed the following experiment, which yeah, you, you do the, ex often works this way, you do the experiment and you go to literature and you find the paper that, this is incredible. Back in 84, they anticipated this experiment. It's like, bring some lead bricks, do an atomic fountain, bring it near the bricks, and then they extrapolated some parameters, which at the time were completely unreasonable, but now fold into where our apparatus is. And they say, well, you know, you can see these really interesting, uh, in their view, of effects that are associated with the fact that delocalized atomic wave packets, uh, one wave packet sensing one acceleration, another wave packet sensing a different acceleration, I cannot find a common reference frame that satisfies this wave packet and this wave packet in the sense of a co-moving frame where space-time is flat. Uh, <coughs> go and you know, bring, them, bring those separated wave packets near something that generates curvature, and you will see a, a phase shift, which we calculate, that's just dependent on the curvature and, and quantum mechanics. And so this has been kind of a, a, an esoteric goal for the, in my mind, for our community for a number of years. And uh, we're finally there, I think, and being able to nail this shift. <laughs> and uh, different ways of seeing that we're really sensing this quantum curvature cor correction. One of them is to just change the separation of the wave packets and look at the differential uh, shift. If this is, and so we change the separation by changing the order of the beam splitters. Uh, this uh, 20H bar K or 10H bar K or 5, we can scan that and scan the amount that the wave packets are separating and sensing the different uh, accelerations uh, due to curvature and then model that. And uh, this, is, this is what theory says and this is what uh, our data is saying. And this red line is the kind of what would happen if you didn't uh, account for this quantum curvature correction. Uh, been lots of theory over the, the past years. I think one of the coolest papers I've read on this is from Bourdais back in 2003, where he also drills into this effect, and he derives a so-called midpoint theorem, where he just nails theoretically how to, how to calculate it. So that's a pretty interesting reference. Uh, so, you know, and wh where are we now? Well, so I feel like we're getting a good understanding of uh, the gravity gradient systematics, and we're, uh, you know, kind of learning what interesting physics we can explore with that systematic in terms of curvature, we're folding that into EP. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get some of those systematics under control. Yeah? Um, so on a related note, is, um, you know, with that big of an effect from just seven lead bricks, I mean, is there a problem when the grad students walk around the lab or the elevator goes up and down? Is this going to be? Uh, uh, yeah, the, be the beauty of, of, of the gravity gradient is, it falls off quickly, <laughs> so yeah. But uh, you know, we have more noise than we expect. So I mean, there could be st who knows what's going on just yet. But you know, you calculate the car in the parking lot and stuff like that. It's not so tr troubling. Yeah. Uh, well, if, okay. If somebody's there, it's the same chop of your. If, you know, if you chop your experiment and, and the car is part moving in and moving out the same periodicity, then that could be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I want to change gear in the last uh, few minutes and. Uh, talk about the future. Uh, with the future, and I think one tantalizing thing to do is to take this idea of differential acceleration measurement and uh, change the baseline. Rather than having 30 centimeters between the two clouds of atoms and measuring differential acceleration, let's figure out how to uh, run that baseline up to on the order of a gigameter uh, and do this in space and have clouds of atoms at one location in space and clouds of atoms at another location in space and have a common set of laser fields, light fields, that have been arranged to drive coherent momentum transfer between these two clouds of atoms and then measure the differential acceleration between those clouds of atoms over those large baselines. What have you built if you do something like you built something that's very sensitive to large scale changes in uh, space time curvature uh, or a gravitational wave detector? And so uh, you can cast this type of apparatus, uh, which experiences uh, these sort of metric distortions due to GR, uh, as in, in the language of uh, gravitational wave sensing. And uh, standard to plot, the, uh, you know, you say, well, what's the science reach of such a configuration? It's standard to plot on the horizontal axis, the frequency of the gravitational wave. That's one hertz, and this is 10 to the minus four hertz, versus the strain sensitivity, the amount of stretching of uh, space time. Uh, on, the, on the vertical axis. And uh, we've done that analysis for kind of the parameters that are available with atom optics. And kind of in space, you can have longer interrogation times. The wave packets can separate not by tens of centimeters, but by meters. They still have to maybe fit inside your satellite. 
And it turns out you can build some really compelling, we think, uh, gravitational wave detectors. Like this blue curve, here's a strain curve that's achieving uh, with hardware which is, we think is buildable, uh, strain sensitivities which are uh, as comparable with the uh, LISA antenna. And if you're interested, uh, these, these uh, uh, there's a lot of analysis over the years uh, by my group and others uh, on, on you know, what kind of science reach you could, might achieve. Yeah. Right. Why is that? Why can't you do that? And I just want to be conservative. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll talk. I'll talk. I have one slide slipped at the end where you, you you jack up the number of recoils. You do even better. But you know, like at ten recoils now. When we first started doing the theory, I was like, oh, maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's not. Now, for sure, ten recoil works great. And so, yeah, I, th I think there's some overhead. Yeah, John. No, I, you're going to get to it now. Oh, okay. So, I'll. How does this compare with the LISA configuration? Well, LISA is a space-based optical interferometer, and basically what they do is they have laser beams that flash between two satellites and inertial proof masses. This is LISA Pathfinder mission. Just demonstrated this to spectacular uh, success. I uh, really, uh, Stefano Vitali and Carson Donsman and their team did, uh, from just point of view of sensor physics, amazing job uh, with that mission. And uh, the idea is these, you have proof masses which are inertial, and you, uh, you look at the, uh, uh, the relative displacement of those proof masses as they're flying through geodesics, and uh, differential acceleration is uh, due to maybe a gravitational wave. You have a problem due to laser frequency fluctuations so, uh, that can masquerade as gravitational wave signatures, so you have to have basically an orthogonal arm uh, that use basically there to measure the laser fre re frequency fluctuation and in the difference uh, what you get at uh, the physics due to gravitational waves. The atom interferometry proposal basically removes uh, the mechanical proof masses and inserts a, a cloud of atoms. And by so doing, and I, I don't really have time to drill into the details here, but the atoms, since they're great clocks, they, they kind of measure the laser phase and frequency and wavelength, so you don't need the second pair of satellites to do that for you. The atoms are doing that. Thereby, system engineering-wise, you eliminate one of the pairs of satellites. And then also the atom is there and is providing a great inertial reference frame because it's, I mean, especially we're proposing to do this with strontium. It's got almost zero magnetic moment and uh, it's, it's there isolated uh, in, in, in space. It's only seen the gravity gradient of the spacecraft. It's a really pretty great situation. So, uh, you know, just in terms of implementation, uh, this, in addition to the fact we think we can get nice sensitivity, it looks like uh, you know, the, sense, the, the system engineering looks feasible. Uh, let, me, let me try and wrap up here, so I've got to be able to advance the slide. There we go. Why would you want to build a gravitational wave detector when, uh, I mean, LIGO's been fantastically successful. LISA will be successful. They just, I mean, I think everybody thinks now you put down $2 billion and you will have that detector and it will fly in 10 or 15 years. Uh, well, there's a growing science argument that goes along the following lines. If this is uh, now looking at kind of signal sources as a function of frequency and uh, what they call characteristic strain amplitude, this is the LIGO, advanced LIGO detector. This is uh, the LISA detector. And you notice that LISA is down here at low frequencies. LIGO's here at high frequencies. There's this mid-band where there's not great coverage yet. If you look at a black hole, black hole merger, as the thing spirals in, uh, first, you know, they're, they're out way out large orbit radius is taking, uh, uh, you know, for, they're spiraling for 10 years at this strain sensitivity, uh, I mean at this frequency, and then as, of, as, they, as they start to coalesce, they uh, spin faster, and uh, when they're, I keep on trying to, <laughs> they spin faster, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, the, the, the orbital period uh, increases, and, uh, you know, so you, you have tenth of a hertz and one hertz, and they, they spiral from very low frequencies up to the point where they coalesce, which is what LIGO captured. And people are saying, hey, let's look at, this is uh, uh, 150914, uh, and th this is this part of the, the signal that LIGO famously captured. Wouldn't it be great to have as a precursor to look at it in this region here, and you, you, you do better tests of GR, the theory of how the, the black holes merge, and also you have a kind of a pre-trigger, it's like, okay, I know something's happening here, and like in a couple days you're gonna see something in LIGO. And so there's a strong uh, case that's, I think, building to uh, basically look in this frequency band. And this is articulated, I think, really well by this paper from Sasana. It's on the archive. Uh, 
Now skip this. To make, to make the atomic physics work out, we want to drive single photon clock transitions in strontium. And uh, I'll finish with this slide, say that I, I feel like this is the beginning of the story for this uh, detection methodology. Uh, if, if you do uh, what some, some uh, call a dynamic decoupling of uh, acquisition modes, uh, we've, we've called them resonant operation modes, where you utilize the fact you can drive long interrogation sequences to make like a lock and amplifier for the, uh, the gravitational wave, you can really get fantastic sensitivity. So this is a strain sensitivity plot using what we call a resonant detection mode, detailed in this uh, archive posting. Uh, and uh, you know, there's, this is a number of kind of resonant loops. And you, you just, you, if you believe this can work, you get fantastic sensitivity levels. On this chart, the LISA antenna doesn't show up. And uh, what's exciting about that is that uh, you know, way out there in the distance, people think you may be able to uh, test inflationary cosmology. This is a characteristic strain amplitude of, of, of just the stochastic backgrounds as a function of frequency. And the right detector looks like it can get uh, into a regime where it can test uh, models of inflation. And so that would be the long-term uh, science objective. Uh, I want to finish here. Thank you for your attention uh, early in the morning. Here are the, the people who have con are contributing now to the experiment. Uh, Jason Hogan, a colleague of mine, is co-PI on everything I've talked about. A uh, great team of postdocs, uh, Asenbaum, Kavachi, and, and Brown, who came from the, the, uh, the, the, the LIGO community, is now helping us with data analysis. Chris Overstreet, Harvard grad, as an Harvard undergrad, now uh, uh, a mid-graduate student doing great work. I should put Susanna Dickerson's name on this list, who did a ton of what made this all possible. Uh, and then our theory collaborators, uh, Sergey uh, Rajendran and Peter Graham. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Mark is indeed true. Very early in the morning in California. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, uh, maybe a dumb question. I should know this, but the uh, inflation is that what? What are you looking at? I mean, what is? How did that oh, happen? Oh, oh, okay. Don't ask me. I mean, it's like, you know. <laughs> Uh, inflationary cosmology of quantum fluctuations yeah. that, as as uh, your, your universe is expanding, right. uh, cosmos is expanding, those fluctuations get locked in as uh, space time ripple. And so there's, and, these, are, these ripples that are kind of going. And they're, they're everywhere, yeah. and 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 the, so those are stochastic fluctuations. This are, you know, certain noise spectrum that you would hope to characterize at high frequencies above a hertz. Uh, you can get away from all the other fluctuations due to like the fact that there's astrophysical sources uh, merging and it's thought that you might be able to set some limits on these inflationary models. Uh, and then uh, BICEP famously attempted to capture that at essentially DC. They captured dust in the you know, BICEP too, but it's, it's looking promising that in the, the future versions of that, they'll see uh, maybe you know, that at, at DC. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, we've done the phenomenology for that. So the question is, what happens if it's moving, I think? And, you know, the uh, problem with velocity close to C is you have, it, it's, it flies by your detector too quickly. You know, so, and so uh, you, don't, you don't get much uh, interaction time, if you will. So it's, it's got to be a dramatic interaction to see that. But if you start talking about uh, you know, relative velocities on the order of meters per second, then you start to be able to see uh, relativistic uh, GR phase shifts, and uh, that, that turns into tests of the PP, PPN parameter constraints, which is one of our objectives down the road. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a detailed discussion. I don't know if I can do it justice here, but um, a lot of the hardware that's associated with uh, that system is being developed uh, right now for defense applications and atomic clocks. So you need, you need a good, strontium atomic clock, and that's being developed by the Europeans, the Japanese, in the US, uh, I, even at the company level. Uh, that hardware needs to be absolutely reliable, and so you, you once you have that strontium optical atomic clock and the associated laser systems, 
that's like this, you know, you, that's the sensor you plug onto the spacecraft bus. Uh, you need then to have good telescopes. Uh, those telescopes we know how to build, and those have to be anchored onto the bus. And then you need to have a good guidance navigation control system to point the telescopes at each other. Those are the core subsystem elements. And I would argue that each one of those is appearing uh, feasible. Uh, and because that constellation, you just have to point two telescopes at one another rather than point two telescopes and then open up a third arm, the, the guidance navigation and control architecture, I think, is more straightforward than it is for the LISA constellation, which gives us hope that you know, this is something that we could, we could put together on a, a decade-like time scale. Are there satellites that could be ridden upon or yeah. dedicated well, there, there, so we've been scouring the world for the kind of uh, one appealing concept. Uh, this may be snake oil, but uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ideas is to go into a super geo orbit. Uh, uh, LISA is in a helio orbit, so you've got to get way out there, L2 kind of thing, and that's expensive. Go super geo, uh, so a communication satellite uh, launch can take you there, and you sit on these things called Esper rings that uh, sit in the, beneath the communication satellite, which is like, if you want to know how big those satellites are, it's like launching a Chevy Suburban into space. And then there's this little ring that sits beneath it, and on that Esper ring, you can put a pair of satellites that would be uh, ejected from that ring when you got to geosynchronous, and those become, uh, after your suitable thrust maneuvers and so on, the two arms of your, uh, of the, uh, the two stations of your, your uh, network. And uh, those Esper ring buses, there's uh, one that's on mothballs right now, uh, at a naval research lab called JMAPS that was going to be used for uh, astrometry to you know kind of map out where the stars are, and that looks to have all the you know the appropriate GNC guidance navigation control features. Uh, that bus is like a fifty million dollar satellite bus. So there's a story to be told that it's not expensive to get it, because you can be symbiotic uh, with a Comsat and you have already DOD has already developed those buses that it, you know if the if the Atom hardware works out. There's a story to be told that it, it, it could be cost effective. But uh, that may just be uh, snake oil. Why do you go, su why super geo and how super? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, well, it's, it, uh, you, you want to go super geo for, uh, to get the baseline up. So, okay. so it's, it's significantly. Yeah, okay. it, well, you, I mean, you have scaling depending on, uh, our dream is like, uh, uh, to, be, to be out at uh, base, but 10 to, 10 to the 7, a few 10 to 7 meters, which, you know, is close to geo, you know, it's, but if they, and, and the orbit analysis gets is pretty interesting as you get, I mean, this, uh, you start to worry about the fact that you might want to start orbiting the sun if you get too far out, and so you have to be careful about knowing the relative velocities of satellite, and we've been collaborating with people like Goddard who know how to do that kind of math. Questions? Join me in thanking for a beautiful Thanks a lot. Thank you.